Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Ah, come on, we can do better. Good morning, North London. And happy Sabbath. I say welcome to you all who are in the sanctuary and those who are online and watching us. I say welcome to this Sabbath day, a day that you'll never see again. So enjoy it while it lasts, right? Uh, this morning, I would like to say thank you for worshiping with us as you are preparing, or as you, as you prepare this morning to come to church. You physically made yourself look good coming to church, and you do definitely look good. But I would like to encourage us that uh, as we prepare physically, may you also prepare spiritually. For as I read Psalm 100, which says here, a joyful noise unto the Lord, O ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before, uh, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God, right? It is he that hath made us, and uh, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. For it says, enter into, the, into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. And lastly, verse 5 says, For the Lord is good, and his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. I say welcome, and God bless you. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God who art in heaven, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of life that we may see this day uh, the Sabbath day to worship and praise you. Lord, we ask for your spirit that it be with us this day. We ask that your service, Lord, may it be led by your spirit. May we be put down and you be lifted up so that many may be drawn unto you. Bless us now and forevermore for I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Nolo. Please join us in singing our opening hymn, hymn number 21, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. I invite you to stand. Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Light in us, accessible from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days. Almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. On resting, on hasting, and silent as light. Wanting or wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice like mountains, high soaring above. Thy clouds, which are fountains of goodness and love. To all life thou givest, to both great and small. In all life thou livest, the true life of all. We blossom and flourish as leaves on the tree, and wither and perish, but not changeth thee. Great Father of glory, pure Father of light, thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight. All praise we would render, all help us to see, tis only the splendor of light hideth thee. scripture reading and it is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verses 
7 to 13. And we're going to read alternately. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 to 13, and we'll go from the screen. How be it, there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto idols, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Please um, embrace an attitude of prior reverence. If you can kneel, sit, whichever it is that you'd prefer. Father in heaven, we are grateful that you are merciful. And we are grateful that you are loving. And that nothing we can do while we give provision for you to work in us can separate us from your love. We are grateful that you are compassionate and we're grateful that you think of us even when we don't think of you. And Lord, you've seen the week that we've had and you've seen our shortcomings, the way we've stumbled, the way we've dishonored you, the way we've not done things we should have and should have and did things that we should not have. And for that, Lord, I place your people in front of you and I ask you please to forgive us. And that I only ask you to forgive us and to cleanse us, but that you'll give us the power to overcome, that you'll give us the will, that you will help us to realize that we ought to live to honor you, to please you, and to do that which is pleasing in your sight. And Lord, many of us are weak. Many of us are easily influenced. Many of us need that extra support. And I pray, Lord, that you will put that support, those resources in place for us so that we may be able to live the life that is pleasing to you. Father, we thank you so much for the ways that you have blessed each and every individual in this temple and every individual family and those who are also watching online, those who are not able to make it out today for whatever varying reasons. We thank you, Lord, that you have thought of us. And we pray, Lord, that you help us to use said blessing to be a blessing to others, that we'll, our lives may not be in vain, and that we may live to be a minister, to, min to be a ministry to those who are around us. Lord, we pray that the words that we hear today may be a catalyst to help us to move and to become closer to you. Lord, make it personal for each of us. Let us not miss that one, two, or three things in the message that you have tailored specifically for the mind, for the heart, for the struggling individual who needs to hear how they can overcome and how they can become more like you. Father, I pray that you continue to be with us throughout this week where we are struggling outside of the spiritual realm. We ask you please to provide for us as you have always done. Help us to be resourceful in the things that you have given us and help us not to be selfish and help us just to live, to make you happy and to make others around us happy. Help us to be patient when things don't look like they're going the way that we'd like them to. Knowing that you know the end from the beginning and everything that you put in our way is just to strengthen us. As you say, Lord, trials are those things that help us to be stronger. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be kind, to be loving. And Lord, may this life that we live not be in vain. Continue to speak to us today, dear Lord, in your mighty name. Amen.
Happy Sabbath, church.
Hello. Okay. Hello, boys and girls, and older boys and girls. Hello. <laughs> okay. Um, Our story today is called All the World. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, verse 19. Sarah watched the traffic move slowly past the window of her dad's truck. How is it possible, she thought with a frown. There's so many people and I'm just one little girl. Her father opened the, tr the driver's side of the door. Her father opened the driver's side of the door of the pickup truck and dropped a bag of groceries onto the seat beside her. Then he climbed into the truck and buckled the seat. Are you hungry for vegetable stew? He asked with a smile, lighting his work tanned face. Your mom asked me to pick up a lot of yummy carrots, peas, and broccoli at the store. So I'm thinking delicious vegetable stew with freshly baked bread for supper. I even bought some apples and bananas for dessert. He started the engine and eased the vehicle into the stream of traffic. Sarah smiled. Yes, please, she said quietly, then turned back to the cars and people slipping past the window. Are you okay? Her dad asked, glancing in her direction. You look serious. You're not your usual talkative self. Sarah shook her head. I'm fine. I just don't understand. Understand what? The girl looked over at her father. The preacher at church last Sabbath said that we should take God's love to everyone in all the world. Remember? He said, go to all the world, she paused. But I'm just one little girl. It's just me. How am I supposed to do what the preacher said? Dad nodded slowly. Good point, he started. The world is a pretty big place with millions and millions of people in it. millions and millions of people in it. Everyone is busy going here and there, working hard, trying to stay alive, fighting diseases and protecting themselves and their families from harm. How are we supposed to help that? Suddenly, Dad steered the truck to the curb. I'll be right back, he said. Sarah watched him grab a sack of apples from the grocery bag and hurry away to a man standing by the road with a sign that read, I'm hungry, please help. A few minutes later, Dad stopped the truck again and jumped out. He hurried to a woman in a wheelchair waiting to cross the street. He guided her from one side to the other, making sure she arrived safely. Then he arrived, waved, and smiled at the man sitting on a park bench with a sad look on his face. The man smiled back with a wave. When Dad returned to the truck, Sarah grinned. Okay, okay, I get it, she said. The world includes the people all around us, right? I can help the people just beyond my window. Dad smiled, and you know what goes good with loving service? A father and daughter spoke together with smiles, lighting their faces. Vegetable stew. Start a list this week of how you can help people. Then get busy taking God's love to them. Remembering no act of kindness is too small in their world. It may be huge. The end. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Please help us to always remember that even no matter how small we are or big we are, we can always make a difference in the world and help share your word and give love to others. Thank you for always loving us, and thank you that we could be here today to hear this story. In your name I pray, amen.
Psalms 144. Time I heard Psalm 144, it was a little weird to me. I don't know why. But verses Praise be the Lord who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Or who trains my hands to war and my fingers to fight. And then in my little 10 year old mind, I'm like, oh, the Lord is teaching me how to fight. But I don't think that's exactly how he was using that context. I don't, want, I don't think that's how he wanted us to understand that verse. So, you know, in my little facetious rude days when the slightest of the thing, kids start bickering and the hand slapping starts. But he's teaching us that as we fight the battle of life, he's there to provide the training and the guidance that we need that we're not randomly arbitrary left to ourselves to figure things out. There's a manual and there's a guide. And just like the people who are marching around Jericho on day seven, they got the chance to sound that battle cry and that wall came tumbling down. So today we're gonna sing songs of victory, songs of warfare, songs of fighting, knowing that we do not fight our own battles, but it is the Lord that fights on our behalf. We're simply the instruments, but he gets the job done. So I invite you to sing with us our first hymn for today, Sound the Battle Cry, See the Foe is Nigh. And I invite you to sing along with me so I can actually hear you sing. Sound the battle cry, see the foe is nigh, raise the standard high for the Lord. Gird your armor on, stand firm everyone, rest your cause upon his holy word. Crowds and soldiers rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throng. Strong to meet the foe, marching on we go, while our cause we know must prevail. Shield and banner bring, gleaming on the light, battling for the rights we ne'er can fail. Rouse then, soldiers, rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throng. O thou God of all, hear us when we call, help us one and all by thy grace. When the battle's done and the victory won, may we wear the crown before thy face. Rouse then, soldiers, rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throng. Rouse then, soldiers, rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throng. One of the reasons, throughout the history of Christendom, there's always been fighters. There's always been people who are here for the cause of Christ, regardless of the opposition that they may face. When Martin Luther nailed his thesis to that Casador, he had no idea the storm that he was going to cause. He had no idea the ripple effect that would have gone through history. There would be no Adventist church, probably. Probably without what Martin Luther has done. And when he wrote this song, he was coming from a place of experience, knowing that even with all the persecution that he was facing, his God is a mighty fortress. And today we're gonna sing this song like we mean it. It may be new to some of us, but we invite you just to follow along with the words and the melody. And take the song as your personal anthem, your mantra, that our God is a mighty fortress and a bulwark who never fails. Oh my 
mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. Our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us one. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing were not the right man on our side the man of God's own choosing just as who that may be Christ Jesus it is he Lord Sabaoth his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled, should threaten to undo. Praise to the King, 
let the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I Amen. It's a delight to hear the church sing. Nothing compares. Nothing compares. We serve a good God, don't we? We serve a God who does not need affirmation. He does not need confirmation. He is God all by himself. Will the church say amen? Uh, we serve a God who... Uh, is who was and is to come. Uh, we serve a God who is not lying in a tomb somewhere, but who was dead but is alive and has the keys to hell and the grave. We serve a God who is not a man that he could lie. Uh, we serve a God who says, if I go, I will come again uh, to receive you, that where I am, there ye will be also. Uh, we serve a good God, and it's a delight uh, at the end of this week of prayer to uh, bring to you the last reading. Some of you missed it, and some of you read it at home silently, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to assess who missed it and who read at home silently, but I want to just share with us today the, the final reading in, in what really has been a tremendous uh, week of prayer experience for those who were able and willing 
uh, and willing and able to get up at uh, five in the morning and uh, six in the morning and to jump online or to read it later on in, in the day. I want to thank the praise team and I want to thank the musicians. Ryan, good to see you on the keys. And uh, it's, it's just such a delight. Thank you, Jewel, for mentoring and for, uh, you know, God has given the church everything that she needs to do all that she needs to do so that he could come. I'm going to say that again. God has given to the church all that she needs to accomplish all that needs to get done so that he could come. The challenge is, how do we do that and how do we give space for him to do that through us? I want to speak today on the evidence of true discipleship. This is a shift from the bulletin. It's, it is the week of prayer reading that culminates uh, this wor Worldwide Church Week of Prayer. And this reading is, uh, this sermon is taken from excerpts uh, from Ellen White. And so uh, I just want to uh, share this uh, with us as we uh, close off the Week of Prayer uh, within the two churches. I had the privilege of, of uh, reading every day. And if you have it been sent to you, go back and read it because it really shares the heart of the General Conference which says, I will go. That's our uh, mission statement for the next five years. I will go. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, we thank you that in the stillness of this moment, you are here. Wherever our minds are, God, settle them to your word. Forgive us of our sins. Fill us with your spirit. Preach, Lord, in spite of me, but preach because of my journey. I pray that you will minister to every here today, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, for you are truly our strength and our redeemer. Let the church say, Amen. Herein is my Father glorified, said Jesus, that you hear much fruit, that you bear much fruit. That's the heart of Jesus, that we all bear much fruit. God desires to manifest through you the holiness, the benevolence, and the compassion of his own character. Yet the Savior does not bid his disciples labor to bear fruit. He tells them to abide in him. If you abide in me, he says, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. It is through the word that Christ abides in his followers. This is the same vital union that is represented by eating his flesh and drinking his blood. The words of Christ are spirit and life. Receiving them, you receive the life of the vine and you live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4 and 4. Uh, the life of Christ in you produces the same fruits as in him. Living in Christ, adhering to Christ, supported by Christ, drawing nourishment from Christ, you bear fruit after the similitude of Christ. In his last meeting with his disciples, the great desire which Jesus Christ expressed for them was that they might love one another as he loved them. Again and again, he spoke of this. These things I command you, he said repeatedly, that ye love one another. For his first injunction went alone with them in the other chamber was a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, and ye also love one another. To the disciples, this commandment was new. 
for they had not loved one another as Christ has loved them. He saw that he saw that new ideas and impulses must control them, that new principles must be practiced by them through his life and death. They were to receive a new conception of love, the command to love one another. Another had a new meaning in the light of self-sacrifice. The whole work of grace is one continual service of love, of self-denying, self-sacrificing effort during every hour of Christ's sojourn upon the earth. The love of God was flowing from him in irrepressible streams. All who are imbued with the Spirit will love as he loved. The very principle that actuated Christ will actuate them in all their dealing one with another, the author writes. And so he lays out three arguments in the context of this message. Or rather she, Ellen White lays out three arguments in the context of this message. The first is, love is proof. This love is the evidence of their discipleship. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, said Jesus, if ye have love one to another. When men are bound together, not by force or self-interest, but by love, they show the working of an influence that is above every human influence. Where this oneness exists, it is evident that the image of God is being restored in humanity, that a new principle of life has been implanted. It shows that there is power in the divine nature to withstand the supernatural agencies of evil and that the grace of God subdues the selfishness inherent in the natural heart. This love, she continues, manifested in the church will surely stir the wrath of Satan. Christ did not mark out for his disciples an easy path. If the world hates you, he said, you know that it hate me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sins, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. The gospel is to be carried, the writer says, carried forward by aggressive warfare in the midst of opposition, peril, loss, and suffering. But those who do this work are only following in their master's steps. And so the second argument she presents is power to defeat Satan. Power to do what? Defeat Satan. I'm glad you're with the preacher this morning. As the world's redeemer Christ was constantly confronted with apparent failure, he, the messenger of mercy to our world, seemed to do little of the work he longed to do in uplifting and saving. Satanic influences were constantly working to oppose his way. But he would not be discouraged. Through the prophecy of Isaiah, he declares, I have labored in vain, I have spent my strength for naught, and in vain, yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with God. Though Israel be not gathered, Yet shall I be glorified in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength, Jesus rec records in Isaiah. It is Christ that the promise, it is to Christ that the promise is given. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nation abhor, thus saith the Lord, I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth, 
to cause to inherit the desolate heritage that thou mayst say to the prisoner, go forth to them that are in darkness, show triumphantly to them that are in darkness, show triumphant, of, uh, let's go down, show yourselves, they shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them, for he that have mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. Isaiah 49, 4, 5, and 7 to 10. Upon this word Jesus rested, and he gave Satan no advantage when the last steps of Christ's humiliation were to be taken. When the deepest sorrow was closing about his soul, he said to his disciples, the prince of this world cometh and have nothing in me. The prince of this world is judged. Now shall he be cast out. John 14, 30, 16, 11, and 12, 31. With prophetic eyes, Christ traced the scenes to take place in his last great conflict. He knew that when he should exclaim, it is finished, all heaven would triumph. His ears caught the distant music and the shouts of victory to the heavenly courts. He knew that the knell of Satan's empire would then be sounded and the name of Christ would be heralded from world to world throughout the universe. Christ rejoiced that he could do more for his followers than they could ask or think. He spoke with assurance knowing that an almighty degree had been given before the world was made. He knew that truth, armed with the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit, would conquer in the contrast with evil, and that the bloodstained banner would wave triumphantly over his followers. He knew that the life of his trusting disciples will be like this, a series of uninterrupted victories, not seen to be such there, but recognized as such in the great hereafter. And finally, a faith like this. These things I have spoken unto you, he said, that I mean ye might have peace. That I mean ye might have what? Peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Christ did not feel, neither was he discouraged, and his followers are to manifest a faith of the same enduring nature. They are to live as he lived and work as he worked because they depend on him as the great master worker. Courage, energy, and perseverance they must possess. Though apparent impossibilities obscure their way, by his grace they are to go forward. Instead of deploying difficulties, they are called upon to surmount them. They are to despair of nothing and to hope for everything. With the golden chain of his matchless love, Christ has bound them to the throne of God. It is his purpose that the highest influence in the universe emanating from the source of all power shall be theirs. They are to have power to resist evil, power that neither earth nor death nor hell can master, Power that will enable them to overcome as Christ overcame. Christ is designed, Christ designs that heaven's order, heaven's plan of government, heaven's divine harmony shall be represented in his church on earth. Thus in his people he is glorified. Through them the sun of righteousness will shine in on them luster in the world. Christ has given to his church 
ample fa facilities that he may receive a large revenue of glory from his redeemed purchased possessions. He has bestowed upon his people capabilities and blessings that they may represent his own sufficiency. The church endowed with the righteousness of Christ is his depository in which the riches of his mercy, his grace, his love are to appear in full and final display. She writes, Christ looks upon his people in their purity and perfection as the reward of his humiliation and the supplement of his glory. Christ, the great center from whom radiates all glory. With strong, hopeful words, the Savior ended his instruction. Then he pointed out the burden of his soul in prayer with his disciples. Lifting his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over flesh, that he shall give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. My prayer is that as you reflect on these reflective questions, God may deepen his experience in your life and in my life that the church truly will follow the mandate that God has given to us, which is that the love of God constrains us, that by this all men will know that we are his disciples when we exhibit love one and each to the other. These reflective questions then are, how do we represent Christ's character to the world? Number two, discuss the idea of living as he lived, working as he worked. How did Christ's purpose affect the way he lived and worked? And finally, what are some weapons we can use to combat discouragement and fear when faced with temptation? May God bless us as we allow the word of God to sink into our hearts that our lives may be transformed. And one day soon, Jesus will come. He may not come in the morning, but he will come. Uh, he may not come in the noontime, but he will come. He may not come in the night, in the darkness of difficulty, in the hardship of struggle, in the pain of the journey, but he will come. For he reminds us that weeping, weeping uh, may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And, and I'm so glad, I, I'm so glad that God is not a man that he should lie. I'm so glad that he says, if I go, I will come again. And so I look forward to the day when Jesus will come. I look forward to the day when he will place an end to sin, to sickness, suffering, and death. I look forward to the day when Jesus will come down the other sky as an old elder of uh, my local church would describe it. He said, you will look to the east and you will see a cloud coming about the size of a man's face. And as the cloud gets closer, it gets bigger and it gets brighter. And as it gets bigger and it gets brighter, uh, the song begins to be heard. I don't know what 
he, the trumpet, will play in. But the Bible says that when the voice of the archangel is heard and the trump of God in sound, whatever key he's playing in, whether it's a major or minor or some harmonic or melodic scale, whatever he's playing in, it is sufficient that it connects with the ears of all of those who would have died in this hope that one day Jesus will come again. And the Bible tells us that the dead in Christ shall rise hallelujah glory to God I am so grateful that whether we are alive or if we die in Christ when he come again we shall see him and we shall be like him just as he is but I thank God we're not coming up with migraines I thank God we're not coming up crippled lamed marred label I, I thank God that he who will come shall come and will not tarry he who will come shall come and will not keep silent for he who will come shall come and we will be able to sing the song of Moses and the lamb said we have washed our robes in the blood of the lamb we will rave from branches because we would have been redeemed and from this world we will be able to say redeemed how I love to proclaim it redeemed by the blood of the lamb redeemed through his infinite mercy his child and forever I am we will be able to sing as the angels fold their wings I was sinking a deep in sin I was far from the peaceful shore sinking very deep within I was sinking to rise the more but the master of the sea he heard my despairing cry from the water lifted me hallelujah now safe and my love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could do Love lifted me, my friend, my brother. I say, hold on. It, it won't be long. Hold on. The world around us is crumbling. The world around us is yearning for the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So hold on, my brother and sister. Hold on, my brother. Hold on, my sister. Press on. Paul says it this way. Not that I have apprehended. But forgetting those things which are behind, I, I, I press towards the mark, towards the goal, towards the high calling. Not that I will get there while on this earth. That's why Paul says he reached, but he is made perfect in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. What a day that will be when Jesus comes. May he find you you, you, and me, faithful. God bless you. Amen, church. Amen. Please join us in singing our closing hymn, hymn number 440, Joy. Be joy, joy by and by. Yes, please stand. Oh, there'll be joy when the work is done, joy when the reapers gather home. Sheaves have set us on to the new Jerusalem. Joy, joy, there'll be joy by and by. Joy, joy, where the joys never die. Joy, joy, for the day draweth nigh when the workers gather home. Sweet are the songs that we hope to sing. Grateful the thanks our hearts shall bring. Praising forever Christ our King in the new Jerusalem. Joy, joy, there'll be joy by and by. Joy, joy, where the joys never die. 
Joy, joy, for the day draweth nigh when the workers gather home. Pure are the joys that await us there. Many the golden mansions fair. Jesus himself doth them prepare in the new Jerusalem. Joy, joy, there'll be joy by and by. Joy, joy, where the joys never die. Joy, joy, for the day draweth nigh when the workers gather home. Shall we pray? And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. God bless you. We want to say thank you. Can you be seated? We want to say thank you to those of us who have joined us online and Thank you for choosing NOLO as your premier worship experience today. May God bless you. Uh, tune in again, 11 o'clock. Um, again, same time, same channel. Until we see again, God bless you and have a great evening. <laughs>